He is a three-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, a four-time Bassmaster winner, a two-time member of the Bassmaster Century Club, and he weighed in the third biggest bag in Bassmaster history. The crazy thing is, this has all happened in the last three years. This week, Lee Livesey joins me on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fish, and freaks. As always, you're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. And um, I hope you're all having a great week. Happy Hump Day, happy Wednesday. You are halfway through the week, and I thank all my humpers that choose to tune in here week after week and enjoy the tomfoolery that is this particular podcast, which happens to be the number one podcast on this particular channel, and I thank you all for that. Before we get into this week's show, I want to talk about something special. And, um, you know, the true mark of people, in my opinion, is helping other people. Not for anything in return, but just helping other people because that's what makes the world a good place. And I want to introduce you to a buddy of mine. This right here is Chase Gallier. His father and uncle run advanced taxidermy. Chase was born with cerebral palsy. And Chase has so many battles that he has to deal with on a daily basis but he's an incredibly determined young man and he wants to make his mark on the world. He wants to do something cool. And everybody knows that I work with Berkeley. I, I hope you know. Um, and they're a great company. And to be honest, I haven't even run this past them, but I know they're a good enough company that they're not going to care. Chase has started Chaser hand poured baits and th this is just one example of one of the baits that he makes and that is an incredible anatomically correct round goby it's not just goby baits it's you know so many different baits all the styles and all the colors that you would know but here's what i want you to do we all buy lots of lures throughout the year we you know tons of lures some of them work some of them don't work but what does work is kindness. I'm going to put down all his information down below. And if you guys can do me a favor, if you guys enjoy this show week after week, I mean, I don't pitch you guys a lot. I mean, let's be honest. Most podcasts spend the first 10 minutes talking about ED pills. I don't do any of that. But here's what I want you to do. Help Chase and support him by buying some baits. I mean, it's a simple thing. But it's more than that. It's allowing a young man that has a lot of challenges in his life that are negatives, but so many positives. The um, Number one, the amazing people around him that support him. Number two, the most important thing that it takes to be successful in life, and that is determination. And if you ask me, aside from all that, he makes a pretty freaking awesome bait. I mean, you look at that, and you compare that to any of the Gobi baits out there, and that bad boy, I mean, it's going to get munched. So that's what I wanted to start this week's show with. Help me help a friend. And that's all I'm asking you to do. I'll put all the information down below, and um, if you feel so inclined, check out Chaser Baits. Help them out, and... Um, I think you'd find that, I mean, helping other people in turn helps you. That's what, there's enough crap in the world. This is something positive and something great that we can all do. And hey, nobody needs an excuse to buy another pack of baits. So check out my little buddy, Chase Gallier, and uh, I think you'll you'll feel pretty good about it. And I do know one thing. Good people catch more fish, and this will make you a good person. And uh, 
Chaser hand pour baits might help you catch a few more fish. And here's what you want to do. I mean, you get that max scent and you put the bait in there. You see how I made sure I didn't get fired by Berkeley right at the very end? Maybe put him in the max scent and let it germinate and it'll be even better. But um, yeah, that's sorry if that is way off topic or whatever, but it's been something that I've wanted to talk about for a while <clears throat> and they have uh, been working on getting a website up there and it's got improvements going, but uh, it's amazing to see somebody that has so many hurdles in life overcome all of them by one simple thing, two simple things, by being surrounded by people that love him and by being incredibly determined. So check those out. Now on to the show. <clears throat> we got a big one this week and uh, one of my buddies um, on the road. I mean, he's one of the dudes who I make sure to spend a bunch of time with away from, you know, the stage and away from the tournaments. I mean, we hang out there, but um, he's just a good dude. Uh, that we're, we, you see the pattern. We're, we're good people. Help good people. And uh, he's helping me by being our guest here this week. And he is literally one of the hottest anglers on the planet over the last three years. I mean, he has won three Elite Series events, one Bassmaster Open. That's four Bassmaster wins, two Century Belts. He weighed in the third biggest. You, I mean, you heard all this stuff at the very opening of the show. The third biggest bag in Bassmaster history. And the best part is he caught that mostly all on top water. He is a um, pretty incredible angler, and I think we're going to have a fun time. So let's go all the way from to Longview, Texas, and hook up with the one and only Lee Livesey. Lee Livesey, I mean, I, I don't need to tell you this. I think you know this, but um, you're one of my boys. You're a guy who I look forward to hanging out with on the road, and I miss when we're not on the road. But you're also one of the freaking hottest anglers in the planet right now with everything you've accomplished in the last three years but as if that wasn't enough you went and had a daughter so you're getting even busier oh yeah no we got a full-on daddy daycare over here and uh i thoroughly enjoyed it to be honest um since the season ended you know i've <clears throat> fished less and hunted less than i ever have in my life this year and and it's been awesome to be honest now don't get me wrong i've hunted a bunch and fished a bunch too so no it's cool i just put her down for a nap about 15 minutes ago and she should be ready to go after we get done with this is it different than you imagined at being a dad like what you know what you expected going into it versus what it's turned out to be well, yeah i think people are totally different um mindsets just in general you know and yeah. i was more, i was more of a i'm never getting married i'm never having kids and very selfish in my lifestyle um and i still am i think a lot of us fishermen are um but in a, in a good way and then uh you know something clicks <clears throat> and uh i met taryn and and fell in love with her and got married and had the kids so yeah, it's, I don't know how to answer that, to be honest. It's freaking awesome. Yeah. But even little stuff like before that, I'm all like, yeah, I want a boy. And then now I'm like, I don't even know what I would do without a girl because it's just something you can't describe. You know, yeah. me and you talked about that a little bit and other people too, but that's been cool. I, yeah. I want another one. Yeah, it's, I think for guys, it's different, you know, uh, at least for me, it was because I mean, you know, you're having a baby and you're, you're excited, but it, I don't know that it felt as real, you know what I mean? Like it, you know, as you hear the heartbeat and everything, that's an aha moment where you're like, but, but when you, when you just, I mean, I think I've told you this and I tell everyone this, like having a baby is truly the greatest high on life like the, i remember like and it's nobody even has to know you're just literally dry i remember driving back from the hospital you know to get stuff and just being like who cares about anything like i the, you've never loved a bean as much as as you do your child so yeah. and and don't run out there and have a kid everybody that's watching this <laughs> you know, it took 
36, 37 years almost uh, to have one. And you got to be ready, you know, whether it's financially or mentally or, or, or both, you know, I wasn't ready on either side of those until, until I did it. So don't run out there and have a bunch of kids thinking you're going to win a tournament. Do you, does it concern you, you, you know, like how are you going to deal with being away? You know, I'm sure that's a lot harder than it once was. So that's just now starting. She's 10 yeah. months old and uh, starting to become a daddy's girl and daddy, 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 daddy. So it's going to suck, you know, but at the same time, it'll make it better when I get home. Um, and I talked about that with a, a buddy yesterday about me and Taryn's marriage. Like I was talking to one of my, one of my good friends, he's been sick. His wife's been sick. Their kids have all been sick. They've all been in the house together for like two and a half weeks. And they're like literally about to kill each other. And I, and I just said, I said, you know, I think that helps me and Taryn's relationship a lot. I'll be gone for a week or two. We miss each other so much that when I get home, we're perfect together until I have to go again. So same thing with the kid. I think it'll, it's going to suck. Don't get me wrong, but at the same time, it's going to make me want to be around her and miss her even more. Yeah. And I think that's true. I mean, I, I think it always sucks. Missing things suck. You know, you're going to miss parties and different, you know, as hard as you try, you're going to miss soccer games or whatever at certain times. But I, I think that like I've always looked at it as, yeah, I'm away a lot, but when I'm home, I'm home. Like I'm not, yeah. I, I don't go, have Tuesday night poker and Wednesday night softball. Like I got buddies who work the nine to five and I'm pretty sure they see less of their family than I do in a year. I agree with that. I tell, we talk about that too all the time. I'm like, hey, I'm gone a lot, but when I'm home, I'm, I'm home, you know, and it, it helps. I think. I think so. I think so. One thing that you from outward looks like you always you know, you might've had to just to be in a father, but you did not have to just to be an elite series pro. I mean, from top number one, obviously we all got to know you through the most awkward yet wonderful fish catch ever on the St. John's river. But dude, you've to watch what you've done in a short period of time. And I, and I really just think it's, it's, it amazes me that it's not being talked about more, to be honest, the amount of tournaments that you've won. Like if you compare over the last it's three years now, but we're just starting the third year you've won four events, two century belts. Have you always been a closer? Uh, no, I think that's something that you just uh, grow into and you hear us talk about it all the time. You know, I'm, I'm in a good regional based area to not fish professionally, but, um, fish yeah you know you know i got it on fork obviously that taught me a lot but uh you know we you can go fish anywhere or not anywhere but every weekend in texas this time of year for 20 to 100 grand uh every single weekend somewhere in texas you can and you know you have people like todd castledine for example that you know never he did qualify for the leagues he just didn't go a couple times yeah. He toured in Texas pretty much and, and a lot of other guys too and made a living touring in Texas. And I was never that hardcore, but you know, I fished the bass champs and the, and the local stuff and he just, it just happens, you know, <laughs> I, trust me. I got my butt whooped a lot when I started jumped up to that level from a, a local level and it took me two or three years to adjust. And then I started winning and winning AOIs and, and then it just, no, that momentum carried over to the opens. I think you're, there's a maturity level there that you reach, you know, before I made the elites, it was in my head. I had a number and it was like your sixth year going into your sixth year. You got to be ready to win. If you haven't already, you see what I mean? Yeah. And like that sixth year, if you're not winning that year and, and on, you know, it, it's going to be a, an uphill battle for you. But, um, <clears throat> you see a lot of guys like, um, Justin Lucas, for example, you know, I watched him as a, as a fan fishing co-angler FLW, FLW, then the elites. And it took him a couple of years and man, you know, his fourth, fifth, sixth year in there, he started winning and, and just not dominating, but he was top 10 AOI and winning tournaments. And I think there's just a maturity level there that you grow into. 
But what, I mean, can you, outside of just being maturity, like what is, the, like you hear people say, like when I learned to win, like there's, there's people that go a long time and just are always close. Is there such a thing as learning to win or is that just one of those terms that people throw around? Uh, I think there's kind of two ways to look at that. I think you learn mentally to be smarter, more stubborn is good sometimes to win and bad at the same time to, to, to bomb. But I think a lot of it is just being, uh, I keep comparing people because that's what I do. Uh, looking at other people. I don't like to talk about myself like Jason Christie, um, yeah freaking winner he's been winning since he was local at grand winning an flw winning on the elites you know the dude just knows how to win and it's uh he's got a different personality almost like i said that selfish personality that i'm gonna win and crush your skull in way out and that's kind of how i fish you know i kind of model my fishing to a hackney and a christy you know somewhere in between you know and christy acts like he's just power shallow spinnerbait dude can beat you doing anything yeah. and he eat up the water um you know so I, there's guys that i kind of look at uh, look up to as not just mentors but i like their fishing styles and that's kind of what you see from hackney and christy do when they get on something they smell blood they're gonna freaking keep their foot on the pedal and they just know how to win, you know? And, and once it happens, you kind of just get a little, a sniff for it, you know, like, like Polinick, you know, it yeah. is, it is. you know, now I think Polinick outworks every single human being on the face of the earth, fishing wise. <laughs> you know, half the time in practice, I'm like sitting at the dock looking at my watch. I'm like, I'm about to DQ Brandon Polinick. He's going to be late. And dude will just roll in in the last, not really, but uh, he, works harder than anybody i think there's guys that just work harder than everybody else and then guys that just not that we're not working hard daylight to dark but you know those guys that work hard get the best results at the end of the day over time yeah long term it's the key and I, i'm gonna prove to you i said at the beginning of this that you're one of my boys i'm gonna prove to you that you're one of my boys right now because if i don't tell you this I mean, it's probably better for the podcast to get all sorts of comments. I don't know what angle your camera's on or whatever, but your hands, when you've got them in front of the camera, your hands look gigantic. You look like one of those world championship arms. Look at them. <laughs> Twice the size of your head. <laughs> so I'm just letting you know I, as one of your boys um, so, that, so that they don't start calling you. For, I mean, unless I've never noticed and you have freakishly large hands. Look, needs to send me bigger gloves. They sent me some uh, XLs the other day that were like mediums. <laughs> um, i like that i like our little group you know there's a there's a weird little not weird a good vibe to the elites this year that i brought up in uh, that last article i did on Bassmaster. man it feels different this year and i know i'm just talking like i'm running this podcast but go ahead it's not yeah, a pot. It's, yeah it's mine it really? feels different, man it feels more competitive everybody seems a little bit more on edge like I went down and pre-practiced the first two events uh, because I'd never been there. And man, there was a lot of our guys down there and a lot of them that don't pre-practice and there's just a different vibe in a good way. You know, I think it's going to be a really, really good year. You know, we have a cool group of anglers right now. We still have all the, the old heads. Like we got Larry Nixon back and David still fishing and Rick Clun. And then we have another tier down in the, Hackneys and the Christies and the Swindles and Ike and Ellie's. And then there's a huge group of guys like my age, you know, in their thirties, you know, yeah. Chris, Seth, Matt, me, Caleb to Mike Huff and Jake Whitaker and Brandon Cobb and Shane LaHue and, and a million more, but there's just, you know, fishing is like a fraternity. It is, you know, there's always going to be, I don't like him, but that's just life. So I got a cool little vibe. And then there's obviously the, the younger crew that like, I feel like I'm the younger crew still, and I'm in the middle now. Uh, there's a whole other group of young kids that, you know, I had no idea how to do what they're doing at that age. So it's a cool little feeling this year. I think it's going to be a cool year. Why do you think it's different? I just think we're getting that competitive. As yeah. a, this is our fifth year after the split with MLF. 
And, you know, we've got some of those guys have came back, obviously, but I just, it feels really strong right now from Brian News, you know, to it's just crazy. And the guys we get back every year, like Hallman's and, and stuff like that that are qualifying that have obviously been proven winners on the tour. So it's just a different vibe. I think everybody's like, oh, oh, you know, this is, this is serious. There ain't no laying up, you know. There's only, you know, Cox can act like that, but the rest of us have to get on the grind and and get serious. You know, you got Matt out there losing 70 pounds or 60 pounds, whatever he did. So it's it's different. It feel, I got a good vibe this year. You know, I saw Combs out grinding free practice down there and, and he might, but I don't feel like Combs is a big pre practice guy. You know, yeah. he was up from daylight to dark. You know, I feel like some of those guys in that age range that were kind of starting to turn down a little bit, something clicked. And even with Keith last year at the end of the season, you know, he had a bad season and then won the open on Rayburn. And I feel like it just, there's another little fire in the, or iron in the fire right now that we're sharpening as a group of anglers. Yeah. You mentioned Cox and, and he is an anomaly. Like the way he looks at things. Is that frustrating to compete again? Like, I mean, he's the happiest man on earth. Like I've never seen him unhappy. So I don't mean frustrating in a bad way, but in some ways you you're like, you, well, I get it why Brandon Polnick wins angler of the year because he's the last guy in the water. And then you got Cox who literally ha- hardly pre fishes in some events and doesn't embrace forward facing sonar or anything like that. Is that frustrating to compete against him or what's your thoughts on him? No, I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't call it frustrating. It's just him, you know, he's just good, whether it's mentally or, or knowledge or, or, you know, the same thing or, or what he's just got it. You know, he knows how to win and off the beaten path. And there's guys that are like, not everybody's like pollen it. And I kind of talk about this a lot too. I mean, Hank Cherry, good friend of mine, you know, he is not daylight to dark. Yeah. You know, he's not any, he, and he wins obviously. And he's a great angler. You know, everybody has their little cup of tea, you know? And I think that goes for everything. You know, some guys are really organized to the tea, like Carl and everybody's name I'm saying are, are friends of mine. You know, Carl's stuff is like perfect and clean and they're shooting videos there for, you know, whoever. And, you know, I'm in my office and I got crap everywhere and my boat's in just a boat storage stall, you know, and I won't get my stuff ready until I leave. But, you know, everybody just has a different, you know, tick to their clock and they make it work. You know, a lot of guys like to get to Florida real early and fish all around. And I'm one of those that I get there the day before and, and go Cox just gets there, you know, the day of the tournament goes. So I think everybody has their own little niche on how it works. I think it's real important to be yourself too. And that just, I talk about that a lot and, and people think it's always personality, but I think if you go and try to be Brandon Polnick or you try to be Caleb or whoever, you know, put any name there, it, it doesn't work unless you're yourself and unless you fish the way that you should fish. That's somewhere where I think you've really excelled at from the start too. Like it, the Lee that I met on day one at the St. John's river, it's your first elite series event. Is the same. I mean, I just know you better. I've drank more beers with you at this point. I mean, we've known each other better that way, but you're the same person. You've never had. Did you ever have that part where you're like, you see a lot of anglers that come on the elites and they immediately want to conform. They immediately want to give the industry what they think the industry wants. Uh, No, I wasn't. And obviously that first tournament helped. um, Yeah, for sure. Uh, being right along Rick Clun and and everybody else watching him win. But I I think it, what you said correlates with everything you do from what I just said, storage, uh, getting, and we're all organized. We all, you know, Matt Robertson might say, Oh, I don't care. I'm not organizing. Cox might say, I got one frog in my whole boat. And trust me, they're all organized. They all have a game plan and all that. But I think everybody's like me and Caleb are totally different in how we fish and how we practice. Caleb will call me at like 10 o'clock and be like, man, I caught one on the dam at Chickamauga and then I caught one at the dam at 
Dayton and up to Chickahominy. And I'm like, what? Dude, I'm still in takeoff cove on the third dock. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> how did you just use a whole thing of gas? But, you know, that's just everybody's different in how they approach practice, preparation, and, and everything. You just got to make it work for you. You know, I'm a big, I'll just keep a couple rods in my hand and I like to force stuff until it's not working and then i'll then i'll back up you know caleb he'll have 40 rods on his deck or you know 20 like every day he'll have 20 and he'll go through all 20 of them and figure something out da, 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 da. that's not me you know it's not my game I, I don't, i'm not even going to move that fast to be honest you know i'm going to have <laughs> five rods on there and what i have confidence in and go and it works for everybody you know like i can he's a hardcore fast 20 Spans. rods yeah. psychopathic spaz but it works for him you know he can cover sure does when he figures something out it's it's on it's game on and that you know that was one of the one of the ones i was talking about seeing people more intense he was down in florida the whole i was i just went down there and drove i didn't even fish but for a couple hours but dude he was down there for like two weeks pre-practicing those two you know this same kind of goes back to the combs thing i kind of feel like that age group, that Combs, the Iconellis that have won every, or, you know, won all kinds of stuff in our sport. I feel like they're lighting a fire back underneath themselves. So we're all kind of seeing that going, okay, everybody's stepping their game up right now. Yeah. I, I mean, in the Ike thing, I mean, it's, this industry is so cruel. Like, I mean, the dude took a year off, went and requalified through the opens, which is incredibly tough to do. Won a kayak tournament. And then he has a rough elite series campaign. And I've literally at seminars and stuff, people are like, does Mike Canelli not know how to catch fish? And he, no, he does. It's just keeping that. I feel like a Mike and I'm, I, I shouldn't talk for him, but I feel like last year, Mike was a conflicted person. Like that's, and this is just, I've never asked him this, but I feel like he came back to the elite series. He wants to be there, but he also wants to go sightseeing with his family and everything. And I think, nothing motivates a competitor more than a tough season. And he had a very tough season. So I, I would imagine Mike is going to be a handful for everyone to deal with this year. Yeah. But if you would have asked him last year, you just said, somebody said, does Mike actually, I can only remember how to catch a fish. He didn't. He looked at me at the weigh-in line at Santee Cooper. We, he had like one or two fish in his bag, whatever it was. And he looked at me and said, I do not know how to catch a bass right now. And it, and it was in his head mentally, you know, whether it was like we're talking about preparation going into the season or just like you said, something outside of that realm that we don't know. But anyways, we don't, we don't have to get on that. I, I feel a really cool season coming on a lot of serious, a lot of competitiveness. And it's going to be cool. I think. I don't, I don't want to quite leave this and we don't have to talk about it, but how does that happen? Like, is it all just mental? Like in this sport, more than any other sport out there, more than golf, more than anything you want to compare it to, this is a sport where you can literally go from contending for angler of the year every year to being way outside the classic. How does that happen in fishing? I mean, obviously, some of it can be circumstantial and just bad yeah. luck. I think you just get in a you get in a funk. And it's just like any other sports, you know, momentum is huge. Confidence is huge. You know, there's a reason that Kevin is king of our sport. You know, it's, it's confidence. Uh, God, who was, I was with Pete and uh, Riz from the Bash University last yeah. week. filming some stuff. And Pete told me a story about being Kevin's co-angler, like whatever, 30 years ago on Lake Eufaula in Alabama. And he said that Kevin hooked a 10 pounder on a crankbait and fought this fish like a giant 10 or 11 pounder all the way to the boat, jumping all over the place. And it, it was like in Pete's hands and it came off a 10 pounder. And Pete was, you know, younger and like, <laughs> oh shit, I just lost Kevin <laughs> this 10 pounder, you know? And he said he looked up like waiting on Kevin to freaking I can him with a rod across the face or something. And Kevin had already made another cast, was already halfway down with his crankbait, never said a word. And Pete was just like, what the hell? And like got back on the back deck and started fishing. And Kevin never even said a word about it, just fished and on to the next one. So, I mean, it, when your confidence is through the roof, you don't waste any time. Every little wasted second is an opportunity to 
catch a fish on the last cast. I've catch so many fish on last cast. Man. Whether it's, I mean, whatever you figuring stuff out. It happens a lot. Not just me. Everybody. There's so many times when I'm like, oh, there's no way I'm going to catch a limit. Nothing's worked right all day, and then the last ten minutes you catch three fish to get you in in the money. I think that's one of the most under talked about parts of Kevin's game. Everybody talks about him being fast and they just think he makes a lot of cast, but he does not waste any time. You, yeah. If you watch him compete and, and watch like him I was, his color in the world. Yeah. And, and switching, switching hooks out on a bait. Like he can split ring plot with his bare hands so quick. It's ridiculous, but it's all, all of that is what makes him who he is. Like you, you'll see somebody catch a giant fish. And I mean, what you guys have to do, I think is unrealistic as far as sports are concerned. You know, people get upset if you talk to the the coach in a baseball game during the game, but you guys literally host a fishing show, deal with spectators, have to, you know, control traffic even more so for him back in the day when there was no live. So the only way you could see it is that there was no, spot lock so you couldn't hold your boat so you've got to hold your position everything but he never had that dead time like you'll see a lot of anglers catch a big fish and they end up giving a seminar to the camera and everything kevin gives that all that info but that fish is in the well and he's back up there casting right away it, yeah. it's it's pretty incredible if you really break it down yeah uh, uh brian news a lot like that yeah I'm not comparing them to anything that kevin has done but watching brian fish he is, he will catch a, <laughs> he will catch a bass. I saw him catch a bass at Hartwell in the classic and he put it in the live well and cast it in like one second. I, it was like, blew my mind. <laughs> I didn't know what he even did. Uh, so, I mean, guys like that, that make a thousand more casts than you or me or whoever uh, puts odds in their favor. And it's not always like that, obviously, you know, Jay Yellis might sit out on a point and drag up, Cinco around all day for six bites on the same spot you know there's always a another deal but yes i think being efficient and confident is what we were talking about is huge in our sport yeah and i think again new is new that's who he is like if you watch him run around when he forgets tackling the back of his truck he's running up and down you know what i mean like he does i don't he's think only person i've seen fall down on the parking lot like four times sprinting <laughs> Remember, he got hurt in the classic in 2020 for running in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> he, went to bed, he went to bed at 4.30 p.m. that day. What? Yeah, his wife, Brittany, made a post. Uh, he went to bed at 4.30 in the afternoon one day during the classic. Like, not on a practice day or anything. But he, he's crazy. He went to bed at 4.30. I still have a screenshot on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. For me to go to bed at four thirty, I would literally have to be like deathly ill. Like I, I mean, I'm gonna find the highly yeah. inebriated. One or the other. I'll text it to you. I'll find it and send it to you. <laughs> I like Brian. He's cool. He is a really. I I really like Brian too. And then I agree with you. There is. I think when the split first happened, there was a really special time with the anglers that were there. And I used to talk about it in meetings and stuff. You've heard me talk about it a lot. But the reason it was so special is because it, we knew it wasn't going to last forever. You know what I mean? Everyone getting paid. There wasn't cuts and stuff like that. But I think we've seen some cuts happen. We've seen some buddies leave. And we've had enough anglers close in that. You know, maybe they weren't cut, but there was times where they were concerned about it. So I just think it's it's kind of a tightening of the straps. You know what I mean? You're seeing and it's it's only going to get you know, you look at some of the 175 dudes trying to make it through the opens and it doesn't look like it's going to get any easier anytime soon. No, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like I'm ready to watch the opens. I'm glad I'm not in them. You know, you got, you know, all that young crowd and the Bobby lanes and the Ishman Rose and a lot of the invitational guys coming over there and fishing it. It's, it's going to be cool to watch it. You know, I'm a fan of, of every league and all the, all the anglers, you know, I like watching yeah. So going into a season, you know, just a few weeks away from the kick, a week, I guess, away from the kickoff of the elite series. How, um, how much time have you spent prepping, getting everything rigged and ready to kick off the season? Uh, you know, I just got the boat out of the wrap shop. 
trucks in the wrap shop right now. You know, I don't do a lot of prep as far as, you know, going out there and remembering how to flip a Cinco in a reed head or remembering how to get a bite on a chatterbait or a swim jig. You know, I like to have all my stuff nice. Like I just, I'm going through my tackle room slash closet slash beer cave right now. And uh, just, I get everything really nice and clean and then take everything out that I want and put it in the boat rig you know all rigged obviously and, and just go um so i leave on friday i've got to work at lake and trails down there american bait Works store down there in uh, okeechobee city on saturday we got a little meet and greet so i've got to be there saturday and we start on sunday so it's coming up quick man it's just a lot of just making sure, you know, we have two events back to back. So it's a little different when you do that. You've got to have a little bit extra gear for, for Seminole after Okeechobee. It's a little different. So just getting prepped, um, you know, making sure all your sponsors are happy and all your contracts are done and everybody's paid you and you've paid everybody you're supposed to before you leave, you know, and making sure your tires have air in them. So it, it seems shocking to me that you're, picking up your wrap boat the week like you leave on friday today recording this on tuesday well why why is that usual for you to be this far like when i look at other anglers they've been down in florida for two weeks they all their stuff's wrapped um you look it sounds like you're behind schedule to me yeah and i've actually never had a boat broken in before I started the first day of any elite series season, I always break them in the first day of practice. Um, but I did have a little bit of boat trouble this, this year. And, uh, I am behind to be honest, I'm a lot behind right now, but it's all going to work out. And it, it's always something, man. I'm well, always. What do you mean by boat trouble? Uh, well, I wasn't going to get into that on this podcast, but yes, I might as well. So I've been with Ballistic for four years now, and they, yeah. called, they called me two Saturdays ago and said they were not going to sell me a boat. What? Yeah. Two weeks before your season kicks off. Yeah, and I had to get it rigged, wrapped, and ready, and this boat was supposed to be in motion and september to be made um so it has been a complete nightmare on on that end of it put me through a lot of uh instability and financial loss but i've got some really good friends down at ships marine um that got me in a phoenix off the showroom floor and got all my you know johnson outdoors hummingbird Minn Kota, mercury rigged on it and thank god i have a good friend there named jd <clears throat> ship owns a place that helped me out so much. And I had some other companies, obviously a lot of companies heard about this deal with ballistic, um, going down, you know, like blazer boats reached out to me, uh, tried to help me. And, and, and a lot of people have my rap guy, he's gold at par three wraps, Brent. He's helped me out tremendously, um, too, getting me out of the bind that, that they put me in. Dude. The only reason I know about ballistic boats is because of you. And I, and I, and dude, if you want to stop talking about this, we can. Um, but I, yeah. I'm a little shocked, you know. And I, like, to, to, yeah, imagine being me. Imagine. <laughs> uh, I mean, I wow. guess. Wow. I mean, I'm wow. not going to trash talk them uh, the little I can. Obviously, I'm mad at them. But yeah, dude, it sucks. And um, I like the boat. He made a great boat. But I wish he would have told me sooner that he couldn't sell me my boat is is the whole problem you know it wouldn't have been that big of a deal if you would have told me four or five so, months ago and this was something that you had on order for a while like this it, it, I, told, I he called me when i was in lacrosse wisconsin asked me if i wanted to he had a 204 mold open so i mean that was in august so just say if it started in september wow wow Dude, that, that is so shocking to me. And it's just another example of, you know, it's so funny because when anybody changes sponsors, whether it be a bait company, rod and reel company, boat company, motor company, everybody 
wants to point out right away, like, oh, well, they're hopping around for more money. Are they doing this for that? And this story is no different than a lot of stories. You know what I mean? A lot of times the pro angler is not in control. There's pro anglers that move for a little bit more money, but sometimes they have to because it's the only way they're going to get a raise. It, no different than any other job. But to have the main piece of your <laughs> The main tool, I mean, you know, it's hard to compete on the Elite Series without a boat yanked from you with two weeks to go. That's that's brutal. Like, do you, are you concerned? Like, first of all, you shouldn't even be thinking about what boat you're going to run two weeks. Like, you went boat shopping two weeks before the Elite Series kicked off. Yeah, man, it's, I'm trying to smile and be as cordial as I can about this. It put me in a bind. Uh, you know, and, and I lost a lot of money for me and my family too. I yeah. having, to having to do it that way and not having an actual boat deal. You know, I've been with ballistic for four years. I didn't think it was going to go down like that. And, you know, whatever their reasoning was uh, financial or whatever they're in, I just wish they would have told me sooner, but, you know, thank God I got good friends and, you know, I've, I'm, I'm cool. You know, I've got a, I've been in plenty of Phoenixes before I've owned uh, multiple Phoenixes before I fish the elites and uh, you know, it's just another bump in the road. And like you said, yeah, sometimes you have to, like we all, the world just saw Polonek have to leave uh, Rapala for mega bass. Yeah. And I haven't talked to him about it and it's none of my business, but you know, it, that was probably a financial decision that was better for him and his family. Sometimes it happens like that. And then sometimes there's crazy stuff happens like this that just happened to me that it's sucks. Yeah, that's about the right way to put it. It sucks. Um, and I, dude, I'm sorry that that happened to you. And, and I know I don't need to apologize, but, but I just look at everything you've done in the last number of years. And like I said, I wouldn't even know that, that brand's name without, and I think honestly, the mass amount of people in bass fishing had no idea about that brand until what you did and to win four events in the last two years, realistically three years, if you're including this year that hasn't even started and to have that happen to you, man, it, 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 it just kind of explains. And, and I thank you for being open about the real reality of being a pro angler. It, it's real easy to be like, must be nice to get this and that. Well, it's not nice to have to <laughs> bass boats are expensive any day of the week. It really sucks to have to do that two weeks before the elite series started. Um, wow, wow, I'm shocked, dude. I'm yeah, I mean, it, it got a lot uglier than that than we talked about, but I'm not gonna yeah. sit here and watch them any more than, than I have to, you know. It, it sucked, and hey, I, I like the boat, he made it, he made an awesome boat, but whatever it was financially or whatever his decision was to cut ties with me you know it, it sucks and and yeah i'm pissed to be honest <laughs> i guess i yeah, guess I'm trying to be nice here but the more i think about it the more i get pissed it, it got kind of ugly to be honest you know yeah well and it would i mean could could you imagine if let's say no, the boat's ready let's say you called him two weeks ago and said hey guess what I'm now deciding not to run your boat. You've built me one and everything. And, and that doesn't even affect the boat builder near as much because you're not doing the deal with them. That just gives them another piece of inventory that they'll, they'll sell somewhere. But this is like, there's no way to recover short-term from this long-term. I'm sure Phoenix blazer, somebody, one of the companies you've dealt with, dude, you're one of the best on tour. I'm sure a new boat will not be a problem moving forward, but short-term, I mean, that's, that's gone money ripped off your family's table and, and that freaking sucks. Yeah. I mean, it, it cost me about $25,000 to be honest. That's a lot of money, yeah. a lot of but you know, stuff happens. You, I mean, we all hear these little horror stories every now and then I just didn't think it would happen to me and it, and it did. But like I said, thank God I got good friends and ships, Marine Phoenix boats, blazer, everybody that reached out to try to help to, to get me out of the bind that they put me in and, and it, it's going to work out, you know, it happened for a reason and who knows what I'll be in next year. I'm running a, I'm running a Phoenix 721 pro XP from ships Marine in Gladewater, Texas this year. And they helped me out a bunch. I really appreciate them. And 
Gary and Teresa and Puckett and all those guys at Phoenix that, that great uh, people. Me. Yeah. That will you turn this? I mean, I'm a weirdo that way. Like if somebody really kind of screws me over, I get super pissed. And that is the best motivator for me to do it really anything. Um <laughs> Do you feel like this will be fuel to your fire going into the season? I mean, oh yeah, I mean it is what it is. That's just human nature. Uh, just once, once <laughs> makes me want to win another one even more. So, yeah. Hope I, I mean, trophy up on one of those stages. Yeah, why don't you just go win the Bassmaster Classic? That's, I mean, that'd be a good one to win. I mean, that 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 is the uh, world's greatest fu in professional bass fishing. <laughs> Yeah, and that, uh, that's what I want, you know. Obviously, I want to win every one of them that I fish, but the Classic is, you know, that's the dream. That's the Bassmaster dream is the Bassmaster Classic. That's why I was fishing the Opens. It wasn't to make the Elites. It was to fish the Classic. You know, you just, I just want to fish the Classic at first, and then you fish it, and then, oh, I want to fish it again, and then it becomes a, okay, I think I need to win that, you know, the last top 10 the first one I fished and last year I was in the super six and to be honest I really thought I was going to win the last day like I felt it you know obviously it didn't happen I, I dropped out of the super six but uh man I felt it the whole time I was confident um in what I was doing it right at my wheelhouse so once you get a little taste of that blood in the classic I think it kind of you know like you see Christy and it's Christy he's a different animal but dude he's poking around every year you know? yeah and all those guys you see that usually if they're in the top 10, they're not far off and, you know, and eventually they're going to hit. So I'm ready. I want one really bad. I think after you've been to a few, and I think especially after you've had a few close calls like Christy did and, you know, Hackney's in that group, there's a bunch of them. Um, I, I feel like all of a sudden it, number one, it's more real because every year you watch somebody's life change right in front of your very eyes. And number two, you realize it's a finite amount of times you're going to get a shot at it. Like, you know, it's tough enough to win the lead series, man, but there's one classic a year and you got to make every single one of them. And, um, yeah. yeah uh, so and I think it goes both ways too. You see it start creeping on people. Yeah. That have been close or maybe not even been close and have fished a bunch of them. So it's it's cool to watch the classic on all ends, watching the new guys, watching the guys that have beat around the bush, watching the guys that have fished a ton of them, never really been in contention. And, you know, there's only going to be a certain amount that you fish as any angler. You know what I mean? Old, new, you never you never know. It's not like we have 10 of them a year. So it's it's a fun week for sure. So your original dream, like with the reason you're fishing the opens was the classic. It wasn't like, were you just content? You were going to be a guide and try and make the classic through the opens or the elite well, was never a. You. And I think everybody's different uh, depending on where they're coming from, but financially me, you know, it was never, I never had all this money or sponsors or all this stuff. I was just guiding to make a living because I liked it and said, Oh, I might get in those opens and, win one and go to the classic you know it would never man if i qualified i'd i got 150 grand to go fish it or something like that so that side of it was just a something that happened so yeah it was definitely to fish the classic you want to walk across that stage you want to go out in the morning at takeoff it's what we all watch man you, know, you, you saw how many people were there last year at a uh, green pond landing it was just insane yeah and if any place can be bigger, it'll be Knoxville. I mean, it, it was, it was incredible. And did a classic morning every year is, is wild for me because I just, you know, like every year you're like, I, I mean, I don't know in my head, I'm like, oh, maybe this year that nobody shows up, but you just see the amount of people that are there. And I think that the classic has that feeling for everybody. It's just intensified for the anglers. But I mean, like you go to your first classic, the, I mean, the first classic I attended, I remember walking in the arena and just being like, you know, the, wow, this is a special place. And I wanted to go to the next one. And this is just attending. This is just going to it and working for sponsor stuff. But I'm like, I'm not missing another one of these. This is, I mean, it's, I think we're just a bunch of weirdos that live in different parts of the world. And, and you know, you tell people your whole life, I want to go to the classic and whatever. And they're just like, whatever, it's fishing tournaments. Like the, 
But then you get somewhere where there's a whole bunch of us weirdos and you're like, I feel comfortable all of a sudden. I'm home. Yeah. And I had a, or you know, Brett Cannon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Got to sit on the classic stage and receive a replica from Texas Parks and Wildlife um, in 2020, I think. Yeah. Maybe 21. Whenever 21, I think. Yeah. Cause we were in, we, it was when we were in Texas. Yeah. And he got to sit up there on the stage and it like something clicked in his head. He was like, man, I got to get back on that stage somehow, you know, and he's fished the opens this year and fishing all night next year. So it's just cool to see other people, different avenues wanting to get there. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a wild, wild event. You mentioned earlier, Larry Nixon coming back. Does that excite you as a competitor? So, and you don't, I didn't even talk to you about this. So, I fished the last, I fished the opens last year mm -hmm. and I was favoring the last one of the year <clears throat> and I was already double qualified. I really didn't, to be honest, I've practiced like three hours. But I, was, <laughs> I was in the boat yard with uh, Andy and all the Yamaha Mercury guys, Minko, yeah. Joby. I just, I like hanging out with our, our pit crew of guys. They're cool. And I was up there shooting the shit with them, hanging out and Larry Nixon pulled up and he hadn't fished the other two. I was like, what is Larry Nixon doing? <laughs> so my head started kind of ticking a little bit. And he walked up to me. And I've never even met Larry. You know, he doesn't know me. <clears throat> and he didn't. He looked at me and he said, you look familiar. What's your name? <laughs> and, and it was Larry Nixon. You know, I said, you know, Lee Livesey. And he said, oh, man, that, that's who you are. You know, he recognized me. So it was pretty cool for him to recognize me. And I was like, you know, what are you doing here? Kind of do, you know, and, you know, he kind of crawfished out of that question and we talked for a little bit and he left. <clears throat> well, I get ready the next morning, first day of the tournament, I'm in the parking lot at Twin Dykes about, you know, unhooking my boat, getting my coingler and he's parked right beside me. And he comes back over to me, like he knows me now. So yeah, so I act like he knows me now since he didn't know me the first time. <laughs> which is totally fine well larry walked over and uh said hey you know nice to meet you something he said do you get all the beer you want for free <laughs> <laughs> and i said yeah you want to drink one with me and he was like if i win this tournament i'll drink one with you and he walked off and when he walked off because i've been talking all night to a certain couple avenues i said larry he said, what? I said, you're coming back to the Elite Series next year, aren't you? And he just looked at me and smiled and turned around. And that's when I was like, shit, Larry Nixon's coming back. So I started all the rumors. I was like, I think Larry Nixon's coming back. And I started, you know, texting Ronnie Moore. Is Larry Nixon coming back? And all this stuff. So I'm a huge fan of Larry Nixon. Uh, and we talked more than that. He told me why he had to leave Bass mm -hmm. and go to FL. You know, it was a sponsor deal. Yeah. Uh, and we actually had a pretty good conversation uh, that weekend and he told me some stuff that I didn't know. So no, super fan. That's, that's super cool. I'm a big fan of, I want to say I'm good friends with Rick Klein. He probably didn't think we are, but uh, <laughs> I like those other guys. I talk to Rick anytime I can. And I think Larry will be in that same little niche of guys that uh, I look up to and like, like Fritz. Yeah. I, love to, I love to sit in a cafe and just listen to Fritz tell stories because he'll just talk the whole time. He's got some good ones. He does. Um, I think it's going to be special to have Larry back. And it's funny because, you know, people it's think that good. this, what's that? He's really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, he uh, is. So really, you know, you see a lot of guys that age just do good for a couple of tournaments out of the year. Larry's going to be competitive in AOI and winning events. Like you'll see, he's really good still. Yeah. He, he is he's very good and a lot of people look at the split that happened five years ago and think that that's the first now larry and mark davis a bunch of dudes you know left bass when the elite series started you know what i mean they had sponsors at flw and it's but i mean it, it's gonna be special uh, and i don't know larry doesn't want a camera boat or a camera on day one at okeechobee but i sure freaking hope because I mean, dude, how do you not give it to Larry Nixon on day one? I mean, everybody in the world wants to see. I know okay. it might be a little pressure, 
But dude, it's not the same if you see it on day two. You want to see Larry Nixon's return to the elites, don't you? I'm down. I signed him up for that. I'm a big fan of that. Let's put all the old guys out there day one. Rick Klein, <laughs> Fritz, keep them going. If if you could bring any pro back to the elite series, or not back, or to the elite series, any pro angler in history, oh. who would it be? Fantasy question. Oh, that's not here now? Not here. Maybe never have been here. It doesn't matter. Just any pro angler. Oh, man, I was a big uh, Ken Cook fan, <clears throat> uh, for sure. Yeah. I got a brainer. Late, great Ken Cook. Um Sure, that's he was one of my favorites. He's kind of in that Larry Nixon niche to me, uh, personality wise, fishing wise. I was a big Ken Cook fan. Now, and this is my I answer my own question if I could just go fishing like one day with somebody, yeah, Hackney Hackney is the dude. I like Hackney. What is it about Hackney? Like, Hackney, I feel is the everybody likes him. Like, my wife has a crush on him, he's just cool. You think like it's Greg Hackney, but then he'll like just slide up behind you. Like, what's up? Drinking a cold beer. But then you're like, oh, it's Hackney. He doesn't know anything about, he knows every single thing about every single person, everything that's going on. He knows, he doesn't act like it. He knows everything. He's really smart. He's kind of that hunter style, the Christy style of fishing that I like. He's just cool. He's cool. Yeah. Smooth dude. With kind of like modern, modern day Denny Brower. I, I feel like, you know what I mean? Like where Denny was the guy that, he was like a pro's pro, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of different pros that come along, but all the pros have respect for Denny. And I feel Hackney's that same, that same dude. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm big Davey Hyde Hackney fan. I'm you know, good friends with Davey and he'd be another one that I like back with, with Ken, but I don't count Davey because I feel like he's going to come back and fish one day and he probably hears that and going to roll over in his grave. But I think Davey Hyde will come back and fish some opens one day and fish the elite series one day. I really do. Really? He's going to leave me, abandon me on the shore. And that's nothing that he's told me. You've told me anybody. I just feel like he's every now and then, like he's been around me a bunch when I've won like crawfish cookouts and stuff with fork. And I always see him just a little look in his eye. Like I swear he's still got a couple of years in him, a little comeback. Oh yeah. And dude, when Davey left pro fishing to do the announcer thing, like the truth is there's a lot of people who leave, because they have to. Like Davey was still very competitive. Davey, you know what I mean? Like, I I think that there's no doubt that Davey could come back. I just, I just don't. I just kind of hope he won't leave the cushy lifestyle that we live together. I mean, he's my he's my road <laughs> partner. I mean, I, I'd have to talk to somebody else, but I'd, I'd also I'm love to see that as a fan. I'd love to see that as a fan. How cool would that be? I'm feeling it, dude. I got a vibe from him this year. Like, I feel like he's feeling it. Whether it happens or not, yeah. Like he gave it like at Fork this year when I won, he, he was he was into it. Like I could feel it. And I, you know, we talk fishing, you know, just in general. Like, man, you've been fishing at home, and he'll, yeah, you know. And I'm friends with a couple of his buddies back home, and I talk to them, and yeah, he's he's still got that drive. And I think, uh, I mean, it's hard to be around your friends, whether it's you know. Kevin's age, him and him and Kevin being friends, watching him compete, or a new friend like me watching me compete. It's gotta be hard sitting there watching it. Yeah. That's, it's just human nature to, and I know he's a lot smarter not doing it and staying in there with you, <laughs> but he's gotta feel the itch. It's not sure. hard to seem smart when you're standing beside me. So um, but I think, yeah, you're right. Like and and to have done it, not not. And not at a low level. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer. I mean, he's won everything there is to win in the freaking sport of professional bass fishing. So um everything but a dance off. Yeah, it's not that dude. I can't believe bass for every time they release that footage, um, it never gets old. The jorts and the running man. Uh <laughs> Aaron loves watching it. Would you ever dance at an event? That's exactly what I would look like if I dance. So <laughs> probably uh, marketable wise, smarter, not dancing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't I know think if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I think Davey was too. <laughs> I mean, I'm, more a, I'm more of a, like a slow dancer. I need, I need a partner. I need my wife up there, you know, put on some, 
Usher, slow jam. Usher. Yeah, I'm talking about like middle school dancing. Yeah. That's, I'm better at that. Where I don't have to do much. Just hold the hip and move around. When you said slow, I instantly, for whatever reason, I'm thinking like he's two-stepping urban cowboy style or something with sissy. But I had no idea that Usher. <laughs> well, I, mean, I can two-step too, but I feel like the, the Usher would be more up my alley. Yeah. Yeah. I still got to learn to two-step. Kelly Jordan was supposed to teach me, but we drove halfway across Texas and I'm Gillies was gone. <laughs> so, he, I mean, I don't know that Kelly was going to teach me personally. We were going to get taught, but he does know how to two-step. Um, the brotherhood on the road. I feel like for you, there's some people who are just there to fill their freezer full of meat and get as many trophies and make as much money as possible. And that's obviously something you're very good at, but I feel like that is equally as important for you. You know, the time on the road. Am I reading that right? Yeah. I'm a, <clears throat> whatever you want to call it. I like hanging out with my friends and cooking and drinking beer. And, you know, I do that on the road every night, just like I do at the house. Yeah. So I definitely like the fraternity feel of it. And, and, you know, we got a good little group of guys that we hang out with and it's a huge group of guys, you know, everybody thinks it's just me and Caleb and Seth and Corey and Chris and Matt, but no, like the Hugh freaking love the Hugh, you know, those guys yeah. and all of them, from to Jake Whitaker and Huff and all of them, you know, I, I, I like that little, that little part of it. We, I mean, I stayed in an RV one time next to Rick Klum, you know, and me and Caleb, celebrated after a victory and <laughs> hung out with us you know it's it's cool there's a i love the vibe on the road you know i'm not as serious as some of these guys when it comes to oh i gotta drink water all night and eat cambodian squirrel nuts and go to bed and <laughs> all this crazy stuff you know whatever politics doing over there you know i'm, I'm very relaxed uh, and i practice daylight to dark but you know, i'm very relaxed when we get off and we always cook. We got a, we're got we traveling with a rookie this year. We're going to haze the shit out of him. But uh, Logan Latuso from uh, oh, cool. me, me, Caleb, and Logan, he's bringing some rabbits to cook at the first event. And Caleb's bringing a bunch of deer meat. So we should be stocked up. I'll bring the bush light. Wow. That's cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing Logan. And I kind of hate it because I know it was his dad's. Robbie, his dad's big dream for them both to be on the Elite Series. And literally one year after Robbie unqualifies from the Elite Series, Logan qualifies. But, I mean, I'm pretty sure Robbie's probably pretty proud and excited to to watch it from another another part. Do you really think that Paul Nick eats Cambodian squirrel nuts or whatever, whatever you said? <laughs> I guarantee it. I guarantee his wife's got him some healthy stuff. Him and Carl, maybe Kayla for Carl, you know, they're – they're health nuts and good, good for them. You know, they like go hiking up in the mountains and doing all this cool stuff. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> They're very yeah. balanced, like as a lifestyle, you know what I mean? Like, you're just like, it, these people are doing exactly what they should do. You know what I mean? In their life. And, and you don't have to follow the script and I no. understand well, they embarrass me on their organization and their health for sure. It'll be a cool year. You know, we got me, Caleb, and Logan, and we got Jesse, my buddy Jesse from Canada, traveling with us filming a YouTube series like we did at the last event at lacrosse. So it'll be cool. There's a lot of people asking about that when we're getting started back on that, and it'll be the next two events. I was going to ask you about that. So that that's, which I thought you're, I mean, for a genre, if I can use that word, that is very busy nowadays. You know what I mean? Like those tournament videos and stuff uh, i thought you guys did a really good job on that final one i think it's super cool that you can use whiskey myers music in your videos um but so is that something you're going to do at every event this year every event all, all nine elites and the classic jesse will be with us and and filming and it'll be me caleb and and logan on all the elites and just me and jesse at the classic but you know everybody you know we'll cook and be Jim and Whiskey Myers ringing, but like we just talked about, you know, I'm a very cordial guy with my with my friends. I love to cook and talk shit. That's what we do, you know. If like when if me and Caleb die at the same time, 
and we get our chance at the gates in heaven, he's going to call us both up there at the same time and pull our text out and embarrass us. <laughs> you know, we talk trash to each other. You know? it's, it's fun. We have a good time. You guys do talk some trash. Who's your favorite person to trash talk with outside of Caleb? Caleb's too easy. Uh, <clears throat> you just trash talked him just like that. Oh, yeah. No, he's texted me like four times already. Favorite person to talk. I love talking trash to Mullins. It Mullins? Gets under, oh, it gets under his skin. He'll call me pissed. <clears throat> Remember at Fork this year when he was around me on one of the days? And I was like, you better back up, Mullins. Like, I know what you're doing. Like, kind of like you whole poacher kind of deal, which he was just island around me to run out. <laughs> It pissed him off so bad that I said that. Like he calls me all the time and I'm like, what's up, man? He'd be like, oh, nothing. Just over here hole poaching somebody. You know how I do. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're never going to let that go like, ever, like for the rest of our life. So, no, Mullins is easy um, for sure. Yeah. He, he does said, hold a grudge. I like to talk trash to Gleason too. Like, really? I still, still call him a rookie just because it pisses him off. It's weird how there is some people that can say the most horrible, but like we've said some bad stuff to a lot, like just jokingly, like a lot of people and you never hear it, but there is dudes like Mullins who like forever. He's never going to let that. I mean, I called him the Bel Belichick of bass fishing ones because he gave me a grumbly interview and I don't know that he's let that go, but he is kind of, <laughs> he's one of the, he's him and the two guys that I always talk about that, that, Gosh, if they would just let it out. Mullins and Keith Combs are two dudes who are honestly two of the funniest dudes you'll ever meet. But for whatever reason, when it comes to competition, it's kind of head down and they're super serious around that. Yeah, it's just their personality, you know, and Combs is definitely like, I mean, I don't live too far from Combs and I don't know anything about the dude, you know, uh, I mean, we talk, you know, we text, but just, you know, work and stuff like that so it's people are weird you know i couldn't talk to mullins and combs like i talked to matt Corey, and chris and seth and caleb you know it would, <laughs> we'd be fist fighting you know? <laughs> speaking of fighting will uh matt robertson ever beat caleb no no it's not gonna happen is it no but he's one for 20 he beat uh, gussie yeah and i feel like gussie wasn't trying I feel like uh, you'd have to really piss Gussie off. To, I mean, but Gussie hunts wolves and stuff like that. Gussie's pretty tough. Yeah, we were in the hall like at Top Golf <laughs> on a day off. If that tells you anything, but, a lot you know, of he's, he's been training. Maybe so. Yeah, he had, dude. Did you see the video of him and when Cooper Gallant, Elite Series rookie, schooled him, beat him up twice? Um, <laughs> and if you see that video, sure he loses, but. <laughs> I mean, he's got some moves in it. Like you, he's been taking some jujitsu or something, but he's trying to do leg locks and all this kind of stuff that that I haven't seen before. But um, I think Matt just needs to focus on. Matt's got a lot of different things to focus on, I guess. But um, that's all. Yeah, that's who he is, though, right? Like he's a he enjoys that. Yeah. That part of the lifestyle. <laughs> I'm not smart enough not to wrestle him yet. That's what somebody, Corey or somebody asked me the other day, are you ever going to wrestle Matt? And I was like, hell no. Can you imagine the repercussions if I lost to him this late in his career? Oh, yeah. It wouldn't be worth it. <laughs> you know, he might have a knife and shake me like a uh, gladiator. Nobody sees it. And then just take <laughs> it's It's like fighting Bob Barker. I mean, if you beat him up, I mean, you beat up Bob Barker, but if he beats you up, God, it's almost irrecoverable. It's but uh, <laughs> he's he's quite a cat. He's quite a cat. So, tournaments wise, this what is your greatest accomplishment in this sport to date? To date, yeah. As far as victories go. Well, no, whatever. But if you say, like, what is the coolest thing, the best moment that you look back at and you're like, is it a victory? Is it, it can be anything. 
and you know people ask you that a lot or ask me that a lot you know what's your favorite victory you know i hadn't done anything else cool i've top 10 some classics top five aoi one year that but it's not the same as winning so god that chickamauga one the first one was so cool because i had a tough year and it was frogging and stuff and it was my first one you can't you i can't even count the fork one the first year with the 42 pound bag on top water because that's too easy you know i mean obviously that was the one you know the world watched it and it was you know third biggest bag ever and it was all on top and on my home lake after having a rough one the first time but that i mean that's got to be it that's it you know i, I want to try to make it something else but that's it yeah you know, the open win this year was really cool it, there's so many people there no knowledge of the lake it was fishing so small and i made all the right decisions on when to leave come back stay change up you know throw everything away and, and i won <clears throat> so i mean even that one's really really special you know holding lane up at the at the way in like the lion king but no the, the best one's for it. it has to be you know it's not even close the do you feel one. do you feel different at the opens at all like just because i mean you there's elite series pros I feel like it has to be a confidence thing. I mean, there's a lot harder stuff at the open. You got a lot more boats to deal with it, whatever. But I look at some anglers careers and there's anglers who haven't won in the elite series, but they've been very dominant at the opens. And I feel like there has to be a, a, a different confidence in people's heads. Do you feel that at all? Yeah, there is. And, and you see it, you see most every open except this year, because there's not many of us fishing them in the top 10. You know, Brandon Lester, he's always up there. Kent is always up there. Brock Mosley, yeah. he's always up there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you just, I think it's the back to the mental game, <clears throat> you know, in those opens, it's it's mental, you know. Like I talked to Brock a bunch, we're, we're really good friends and he does good in those opens and he'll tell you, he'll be honest. He's going to, and it's what he does. He's going to take a chatterbait and, you know, a flipping bait or something, you know, and that's going to be what he catches him on, maybe a square bill or something, but he will go to the ugliest water whether he practiced it or not and, and catch them and make it happen. Cause usually in those opens, the best stuff becomes the worst because all everybody's so good. Everybody finds the best stuff and just hammers it in practice or is there in the tournament. And then that second, third, fourth tier groups of fish, whether they're that great or not, you can make them great, you know, with a little, with a little luck. And I think that's what a lot, you know, everybody says, all oh, those elite guys, winning those opens and doing good and they're getting all this information from the locals i guarantee you 90 percent of the elite guys that are going to those opens are getting zero information because they don't want it yeah why is there less elite series guys fishing the opens this year do you is it scheduling or is it just because of the qualification or because it's different you know it's that you really need to fish all nine of them and i think it's just different i think it's a whole tournament series in itself now i mean right. I, I know it has been that's easy to say but it, it feels different i think it's kind of like okay it's a whole nother trail that we're sitting here watching and like me i would have loved to fish them but just the timing on the tournaments didn't work out good and i wasn't going to fish all nine of them you know not a lot of our guys are going to go fish all nine you, you'll probably have some guys fish all three i think i think kent is fishing all nine maybe a couple other people poche maybe uh, so I think it was just a different vibe. And for me, it was just scheduling. Like I yeah. almost got in this three division, but with the baby, I just said, no. What, what's your favorite thing about being a professional angler? Um, the brotherhood, the, the fraternity that we've talked about already. Um, and I won't even, I'll say something else because we've already talked about that. I like traveling. I, I actually do. I like uh, going to new places and like the St. Lawrence river is beautiful and Champlain is beautiful. And you drive through all these cool mountains and you just see all kinds of cool stuff and meet a lot of cool people. You know, I've met people all over the world that are, it's cool, you know, that I would have never traveled to in my life. You know, a lot of people never leave their little area and I get to travel all over the place and, and fish for a living. It's pretty cool. Yeah. 
I love breaking down new bodies of water. I love going places I haven't been before. Cracking the code. Yep. What, uh, if you could change one thing about the Bassmaster Elite Series, what would it be? I think it would be a few things and it's rule related. I think you should be able to go anywhere you can get to in your boat, no matter where we're at. Like a lot of times, if we go to Chickamauga, they won't let us lock out. I think you should yeah. be able to, and I understand why they, they're doing it <clears throat> per the area's economical growth, but I think you should be able to go anywhere you can in your boat. I think you should use any boat that you want at any tournament. If you have it, instead of being sustained to the same boat all season. And yeah. I think, I don't think there should be any lure restrictions. I think we should be able to throw Alabama rigs, double fluke rigs, uh, you know, anything like that, that we want. What do you think about forward facing sonar? Where's your stance on that? Uh, I'm, I mean, you've seen every victory I've won. I haven't even had it on my boat. Man. Uh, am I good at it? Yeah. I can go catch fish on it. Um, just like the next guy. <laughs> I practice it all the time just as a tool that I have to have personally to compete, but I know when I have to have it on my boat. If I go to Lake Ontario, I have to have it on my boat, you know, and there's other little tournaments that I'm going to, I'll have my mega live on my boat because there's going to be a niche here, whether it's a fish or all my fish are going to come on it. But at the same time, like I won't even have it on my boat until Murray, I'll have it off the first four events, three or four, whatever that is. And it's just not in my mind at all. Not that somebody might win doing it or somebody, a big group of the checks might get cut doing it. It's just not what I'm going to do. You know, it slows me down uh, the shallower I get. And I, you know, it's just another tool, just like the Alabama rig is not magic. You know, yeah. if, if the A rig was legal, nobody would have 75 pounds of bass on the A rig at Okeechobee. <laughs> you know, so. It's just another tool. I'm not a huge fan of it, but I don't have a problem with it at all. I don't, I, I love more people doing it and wasting their time doing it when it's not right, because I'll go down the bank with a swim jig and a square bill or whatever, and cover 10 times the water as you, whether I'm seeing them or not, I'm going to run into the same amount of fish you are. So I think it evens out. Yeah. I, I think the whole lay rig thing and, and me and, Panger to a show called the column this past week. I've been roasted because I was anti a rig, but I also have to be anti at some time because the show would be really boring. If I, if we both agree, yes, you're right. You're right. Next show. Um, so we actually voted on the a rig last year as anglers. Oh, really? Yeah. Going into last season and it was 70 to 30, I think against it. And that blew my mind. Wow. I thought for sure it was going to flop and be the other way or close you know 50 50 50 almost you know it was if i might be wrong a little bit you know i'm sure ronnie moore will chime in but it was like something crazy like 70 30 and i was like what the hell you know like nobody i, I like i like it every now and then yeah i, I wish i had that stat. i should pay more attention to those voting it would have made my argument a lot more compelling on the call with Panger if i was like as a matter of fact um <laughs> But I, do, I don't, so I didn't have that. But, I mean, I think the whole banning of it in some ways was people thought it was going to be everything, like it would just take over. And I think there's some negatives to it, but but I think you don't have to look further than the events that allow it. It doesn't win every event. There's still tournaments won on crankbaits and jerkbaits and tube jigs and everything yeah. in between. What's one thing? that most people don't know about Lee Livesey. Oh. Mm. <sighs> I mean, I'm trying to think of something really cool, but there is nothing, you know, I'm kind of uh, just a generic dude. Um, something people don't, I, I'm a big uh, Pixar film guy. I like, uh, animated movies you know wow like 
And I don't know why I just thought of that. <laughs> like which which are your favorites? Oh, just anything that's Pixar. Like I'll watch any kid movie like that, you know, and any kind of animated, you know, I'm not big into action movies or any of this stuff, but I'll watch a, I'll watch a good comedy, a happy Gilmore. Yeah. And it's, I'll watch a Lorax or something, you know, hmm. or something like that. I, n- I never would have imagined it was animated movies. What about anime? You into anime that the Asian animation? No. No. Just try to. Exactly. I mean, some people are into it. I'm, I'm not either. I bet you Austin Felix is. Who's the weirdest dude on the Elite series? Mm. I mean, Brian knew is weird, but in just a weird way. <laughs> sleeping in the afternoon and stuff weird Kobe Craver is pretty weird <laughs> why <laughs> he's just weird. and I'm friends with Kobe I talked to Kobe yesterday he's just a different cat he is he's weird he, is. he hates he hates you he loves you he hates the world loves the world <laughs> loves the fish but hates the fish he's just a weird guy <laughs> He's got a little of that in him. Okay, tell me something that nobody knows about another Elite Series pro. <laughs> Probably easier than telling me something about you. Oh, man. I'm trying to get out of my group of guys because that's too easy with Matt. And... <laughs> oh, there's so many. We got to come back to that one. All right. On that one. All right. All right. Try not to piss anybody off. <laughs> well, I mean, just because, I mean, just, I mean, I don't know that they'll be pissed off. It all, I guess it all depends on what you tell me, right? Everything, everything that just came to my head was going to piss every one of them off for sure. One, two, three. That's what I was thinking the whole time you're leaning back. I'm like, I wish there was a machine that would just text out what's going through his mind right now. Caleb can't say that. Corey, no. Matt, no. Oh, let's. I tried to even like go to Jay Yellis, like try to find something that wouldn't 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 work. <laughs> what can you say about Jay Yellis, dude? That's like That's what I'm saying. Like picking nothing, on the Easter Bunny. <laughs> there's nothing there. Well. Dude, I, I, I'm still kind of in shock about the earlier okay. converse. I know an easy one. Oh. Mike Huff. Okay. Semi-psychopath. How is Mike Huff a semi-psychopath? Exactly. That's what I said, too, until I rode in a car with him and Skylar Hamilton in uh, Latka one time when Mike was driving. Caleb was with me. So it's just quiet. Mike Huff, cool, easy yeah. going. Super quiet little petite guy. And uh we were like all getting coffee and donuts on a day off in Palatka. And we pulled out a Dunkin' Donuts right there in downtown Palatka and somebody cut him off. And he went ape shit. Like, <laughs> hey motherfucker. <laughs> and we me and Kelly were just like, what in the world? And we looked at Skylar and Mike just drove off like nothing happened. And we got back and nobody really said anything. And I was like, Mike. You're psycho, aren't you? And he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, did you like the quietest guy I know? And you just almost murdered somebody for cutting you off in the parking lot at Dunkin' Donuts. So Mike Huff, low-key psychopath. Semi-psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to talk to him about that on stage this year. <laughs> I, I would have never saw that. I would have never, ever saw him as a semi-psychopath, but I mean, that's, that's, what's amazing about the elite series. It's a pretty incredible collection of people and, uh, dude, I can't wait to get back to work. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, and I think it's going to be, here's, I'm going to reveal something that I think very few people know about you. People watch you compete and watch the, giant bags on top water and fork and everything dude you are honestly and i want to say low-key but i mean low-key to the public i think all the pros know but you are honestly low-key one of the hardest 
most relentless workers on tour and not just at your game, like the amount of time that you've spent smallmouth fishing is incredible to me, but it's also why you have accomplished the things that you have in such a very short time. I mean, dude, I think your work ethic, like it's easy to point out Paul Nick and stuff like that, but like you spent weeks on the St. Lawrence river weeks, figuring out different things. And, um, it's cool to see all that hard work pay off. Yeah, I like this. I don't like people to know that I'm good at smallmouth fishing because I'm not, but I like it up there. I think you're getting pretty good, dude. I think I think you're. I think you're. Good. Is this is it? Tr- is there any truth to the rumor that you're just motivated to get good at it because you want to win in the St. Lawrence River before Corey? I do actually. I actually. Do. <laughs> what makes him and his brother so good? From an outsider perspective, because I, I mean, you're very tight with them. I've known them their whole life. They've always been good. But what is a competitor? Why are they as good as they are? Man, I, we kind of talk, me and my wife kind of talk about this a bunch because she's a big stats person. And Chris Johnson's stats are ridiculous. Yeah. Almost unreal. Like better than Polonix on paper for the short a short amount of time that we've been together like it's crazy how he hadn't won AOI every year and and Corey's right behind him you yeah. know but uh Chris is even better on paper this is all on paper obviously so data they're just good you know they're all good everybody it's just crazy you know they've been fishing their whole life and you know not just up there but everywhere you know they've been in Florida a bunch more than me and obviously they know every single rock on the St. Lawrence river and Champlain. So yeah, they're just good everywhere they go. Chris is a freak. So is Corey. I mean, Corey just almost won a Toyota on the Harris chain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. You know, so is Seth, so is Matt, you know, Matt talks all this shit about him, Matt Karen and <laughs> all this stuff, dude. He's just, I, I keep going back to that because it kind of pissed me off when he said that. I'm like, dude, I know you, I know how much you care. I know how much you, you work really, really hard and do stupid shit like I do to try to win and compete. And uh, dude, they're they're all good. Yeah, everybody. you got a great group of uh, guys right now. Everybody from Larry Nixon and Rick to I don't even know who our youngest guys are, but those young guys. Yeah, yeah, no, and I felt the same way when me and Matt did that show together. He said I should go through it and count how many I don't care. So, like I was almost going to title it matt robertson i don't care and it probably would have been a much because dude he said that i'm not lowballing when i say there was 40 i don't cares but i mean every time he said i don't care i'm like yeah but you really do care i mean you can try convince yourself that you don't care but matt matt cares i mean he's a he's freaking hammering people write him off because he you know he i don't care if the hook's rusty i don't care if this yeah, I mean, you don't get where you are without Karen. He's a pretty phenomenal angler. Don't don't let the mullet fool you. Yeah, exactly. You ever grow a mullet? I tried to last year, and I made it like one inch and cut it off. <laughs> you really did try to? I said I was going to. Like, I, I'm weird. Like, I just went and cut my hair like five seconds ago. Uh, <laughs> Because it just, I start getting icky. And my if, if I, I cut my hair for two reasons, because my wife pissed me off and I'll go shave my head, that really pisses her off. Or just because I get it too long and it starts getting weird. So it was just a weird thing today. Yeah. I shaved my head because nature said it was time. <laughs> it actually was probably about two years after it was time. I tried to mess it for a while and it yeah. wasn't working. But, uh, we're back to work in a few days, dude. And, and I thank you for doing this. And, um, like I said, I'm still in shock about the breaking news earlier. I hate that that happened to you. You are 1000% the wrong guy for that to happen to, because if you aren't delivering for your sponsors, I don't know who is. And, uh, I hope you just use it as motivation and, uh, you whoop some ass this year. Yeah, man. Thank you. It's, it's all good. We got it all going back on track and I'm ready to start. It's a bad day to be a bush light. 
No, I wish it. You kind of got me pumped up now. I'm looking at the clock. Now it's 1230. I still got to work for five or six hours and then I'm going to have one. All right. All right. I'll, I'll have one right now, but the one and only <laughs> Lee Livesey. Wow. That, uh, that show was an emotional roller coaster. Um, and I hate that that happened to Lee. But I secretly kind of love that you guys got a just a little glimpse into the reality of pro fishing. I mean, pro anglers. And, and if you look in the last month through social media, every pro angler that had made an announcement about a new company they're working with, it doesn't matter the type of product, the brand, whatever, somewhere in those comments, you'll hear someone say, well, must be nice. This must be, nice. you know, just jumping around for more money, whatever. And, and the truth is, in most situations, most people don't know the truth. You know, you got pros who switch because they're not happy with the direction of products going by a company. You got pros who switch because they can't get a raise. I mean, everybody wants to get a raise eventually at their job. And and you got pros who switch for many reasons. And then you got people who literally get the rug, as in rug being the boat that they stand on, ripped out from under them two weeks before the season. Just think about that. I mean, think about your purchases that you've made. I mean, a boat is, aside from your house, your vehicle, a boat's one of the biggest purchases people make in their lifetime. Lee Livesey is going into the Bassmaster Elite Series season, and two weeks before, he's told, you're not getting a boat, and he has to literally go buy a boat. Um, unbelievable, and um, sucks that it happened to such a good person. But I thank him for being as honest as he was. And um, and hopefully we all learn a little lesson from this. Next time you want to type that stuff. Next time you want to feel like a pro turned his back on you. Which which I get it. I mean, I've felt that. I've said that. I've. There's more to most of these stories. And... Um, I thank Lee for being open, honest, and um, a very motivated. Lee Livesey is a very scary cat to deal with. So it's going to be fun to watch him on the Bassmaster Elite Series this year. And I thank everybody that was involved in getting him in that Phoenix. And um, wow, that's not all I got. We'll see you next week. Until then. Enjoy Bean and Bob Cobb. Take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?